Hello, everyone. My name is Donna Hicks, and I'm the chair of the Herbert C. Kelman Seminar. And I'd like to welcome all of you um, which, to the seminar, which is co-sponsored by the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs and the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. And we have people registered from all over the world, and we're so grateful that you've taken the time um, to out of your busy schedules to be with us today. And we are delighted to have our dear friend and colleague, Jeff Sewell, here today to give his presentation entitled, Negotiating Across Worldviews in an Age of Political Polarization. And before I introduce Jeff, I'd like uh, just to let you know that this talk is going to be recorded and we will post it on the Program on Negotiation website, and it'll probably be there by tomorrow afternoon, Friday afternoon. And about the format of the hour, Jeff is going to speak for about 40 minutes, after which we will open up the, um, the seminar for a Q&A for the rest of the session. So if you want to present a question, please put it in the Q&A function, um, and then we'll hopefully with so many people on, I'm not sure we're going to get to all the questions, but we'll, we'll certainly try. And um, I'd like to thank uh, Nicole Bryant and James Kerwin and Anna Chang and Diane Long for all their support of the, and work making this uh, seminar possible. And as always, I'd like to thank our beloved Professor Herbert Kelman. And uh, I know he's listening today. He's not going to be on screen, but um, we love you, Herb. And um, in a minute, uh, I will um, just turn this over to Jeff. But what before that, I want to introduce him. Jeff uh, is a lecturer on the practice of peace uh, at Harvard Divinity School. He also serves as co-chair of the Peace Appeal Foundation, which was founded with a mandate from five Nobel laureates, including Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, and F.W. de Klerk. And it's an international NGO that helps local stakeholders launch and sustain broad state scale, broad scale peace and national dialogue processes to end or avoid war. And Jeff is also a partner in the international law firm Holland and Knight. Jeff earned his MTS at Harvard Divinity School and an LLM in international law at Harvard Law School. After graduating from Harvard Divinity School, he taught negotiation and conflict resolution courses for several years at Harvard Law, at the Harvard Law School, where he developed Harvard's first course on complex multi-party negotiations. He's also a senior associate, associate of the Program on International Conflict Analysis and Resolution at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. Jeff's scholarship is focused on conflict with a religious dimension, large scale peace and national dialogue processes and negotiated resolution of disputes involving deeply held values, both religious and secular. His current writing projects includes a book entitled Negotiating Across Worldviews, Resolving Moral Conflicts Without Selling Out. So Jeff, we are so happy to host you here today, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thanks so much, Donna. Uh, you've been such an incredible friend and inspiration to me for over 25 years, and I'm grateful to you for so much, including now this opportunity to speak. Uh, I want to add my thanks to the uh, wonderful folks at PON who put this together and to all of you participating here today. I'm guessing that most of us here today feel all too painfully aware of the differences in perspective among people in the United States and uh, of the increasing costs of these differences from partisan gridlock uh, within government to increasing violence. Um, I think these differences often run quite deep. They often flow from our different worldview orientations. And worldview conflict can be especially hard to resolve. So today I'm going to introduce this notion of worldviews for people who are uh, 
unfamiliar with it. And uh, we'll also talk about what worldviews do and how worldview conflict is different than ordinary or everyday conflicts, so to speak. Um, eventually, we're going to talk about uh, some of the things we can do to negotiate across worldviews more effectively. Before we get there, however, it's helpful to know a little bit about how worldviews can change. So we'll touch on that as well. I teach a class on this topic, and there are many important issues we take up there that we won't have time to cover today, uh, including questions about moral relativism, uh, power asymmetries, justice, the limits of negotiation, and alternatives to negotiation. And maybe we can take up some of those topics uh, a little bit after my presentation. So, what are worldviews? I bet some of you have read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams, or maybe you've seen the movie based on the book. The main character, Arthur Dent, escapes Earth moments before it's destroyed by aliens. And then he travels around the galaxy searching for the ultimate question to life, the universe, and everything. Dent is seeking the ultimate question, but the answer to that question is revealed at the end of the story. And if you don't know it, uh, this is a spoiler alert. I'm about to tell you, about to display the answer to Dent's question. And I don't feel too bad about spoiling this because you can also find it on Wikipedia if you like. So are you ready? Here we go. Do you see it? Most of you probably do. If so, you know the meaning of your life. If all you see is a bunch of dots forming a circle, however, you're among the very small number of people, about 2.5% of us, all men, who have a color vision deficiency, like I do. And so you'll never know the truth about life in this world. Actually, if there are other colorblind people uh, here today, I can't leave you hanging. So I'm going to let you in on the secret. The meaning of your life is 42. Now, for those of you who are curious to know how I and other colorblind people see that circle of dots, here you go. If this were how you saw things, your world obviously would be wrong, right? Worldviews are like this. We see from them and through them. And so they influence how we experience, organize and conduct our lives. But we're not always aware of them and how they're functioning. Our worldviews are part of the field of our subjective awareness and our ability to reflect upon our own subjectivity is always limited. I like to think of a worldview as a way of orienting in and to our experience of life that responds to what uh, people who study worldviews call the big questions. These are questions about reality. What is this? Um, about the origins of this reality, uh, about what we can even know and how we can know it about values, what's good, what's bad, what's evil even, about the future, where are we going, where should we be going, and about action. How do we put our answers to these other questions into action? How should we conduct ourselves? Now, I'm not suggesting that these specific questions are the key to understanding and resolving worldview conflict, or that we'd even ask negotiating partners to respond to these very questions. We'll ultimately need to get uh, a much more granular understanding of what each party's worldview 
presently permits and doesn't permit on an issue by issue basis. But the more granular questions we might ask ultimately could be traced back to these big questions. One's worldview may be more or less articulated or even more or less conscious. In North America and other parts of the world, many of us tend to think of religious people as the only ones with a worldview, but a secular scientific perspective also is a worldview. Worldviews tend to be foundational to uh, persons and uh, a group's identity. And we discern them not just through ideas as articulated by people, but also how we conduct ourselves through action. Um, they're influenced by many, many factors and they're dynamic, they're evolving, they're multi-layered. They likely intersect with other worldviews to some extent. And this is why my uh, colleague and friend, Jane Doherty, uh, who's a real pioneer in this area, uh, likes to speak about world viewing as a verb rather than worldviews. Now, I'm not suggesting that we can put any given worldview under glass and present it as a, a pure and unchanging type. There's probably not much value in talking in broad and abstract terms about the Christian worldview or the liberal worldview. On the other hand, there's a lot of social scientific research and just everyday experience, which confirms that groups cohere around shared perspectives and values. And this fact has really profound implications for all of us. So let's talk a bit about how worldviews function in our lives. Abraham Maslow argued that we humans share certain fundamental needs. And uh, much early work in the conflict resolution field, in fact, was premised upon human needs theory, including the work of our very own Herb Kelman, who uh, Donna mentioned, uh, Herb mentored Donna and me, and many of our friends and colleagues in the field, and he's inspired countless other people. Uh, and as Donna mentioned, the seminar series is named in honor of Herb and his pioneering work. So there's likely a shared set of universal basic human needs. And, and since Maslow's time in the 1950s, uh, this has been borne out through lots of uh, empirical research around the world. In fact, Tay and Dean are cited here have done studies in over 120 countries uh, in, a, in a population that represents over two thirds of humanity to confirm the existence of these basic human needs. Our worldviews influence every aspect of our, of our lives, personal and social. And uh, uh, this includes how we allocate resources and opportunities within and, and uh, between groups to satisfy physical needs, safety needs, social needs. It includes how we regard ourselves and others meeting self-esteem and self-actualization needs. So, my understanding of myself and how my needs can be satisfied. And therefore the ways I go about trying to satisfy those needs are influenced by the worldview I hold and share with others. I'm not making a strong claim that all worldviews emerge to serve human needs, but I believe that worldviews do in fact serve human needs. So let's talk about worldview conflict and what makes it different. And let's ground this discussion in the conflict over gun rights and gun control here in the United States. I'll come back to this example in just a minute, but let's talk about worldview conflict generally first. So our worldviews can and often do overlap a little bit with other worldviews, or, or maybe even fairly substantially. But there's a limit to that, because worldviews would otherwise lose their coherence if they were completely overlapping. And questions, challenges to our worldviews 
feel destabilizing and risky oftentimes. And that's precisely because our worldviews sort of anchor our, our world, our identities, and uh, form and shape the ways in which we go about trying to meet real needs we have. And worldview conflict emerges when beliefs and norms at the core of one worldview are hard to reconcile uh, with those in another worldview. And when that tension, that intersection has practical implications for the parties involved. There are many reasons why these uh, conflicts are so challenging and often so intense. And, and I'll touch on just a few. Um, one is that worldview conflicts threaten sacred values. Uh, these are values with which our identities are effectively fused and threats to these values can feel existential and some people will even risk their lives to defend them. These values are not tradable and negotiating as if they are can escalate conflict. There's good social scientific evidence to support that notion. Another reason why worldview conflicts can be so challenging is that our brains are wired to privilege information that confirms our pre-existing beliefs. The brain responds to information that reinforces our existing beliefs uh, as what scientists call a primary reward, like food that sustains our physical existence. But there's a difference here. Unlike food, the brain actually can create the rewarding belief reinforcing information it, it craves. Another reason why these conflicts can be so challenging is that we perceive and reason about what we perceived in ways that are basically flawed. And there are lots of examples of this. Here are just a few. Um, uh, one is that we tend to think of most members of opposing groups as holding more extreme views than they actually do. This is a phenomenon called naive realism. Um, and we're subject to various cognitive biases that can blind us to differences in perspective and the potential for norm change within our own groups. Uh, and there are social taboos and social incentives within these groups that predispose us against contesting the group's beliefs and norms, even if one privately questions them. Some of you may be familiar with the ladder of inference. It's a tool that was developed by Chris Ardris and his colleagues uh, decades ago. It's been used in teaching negotiation for decades. The ladder of inference is designed to help us understand how two people who have access to a shared reservoir of information, a pool of available data is depicted here might nonetheless reason their way through a series of cognitive steps uh, to very different conclusions. They might evaluate that data in a different way, ultimately. They might focus on different data that's available to them. But even if they focus on the same data, it might be ambiguous or they might relate to it a bit differently. And so they each reach different conclusions. And when this happens, the idea is that the negotiators can walk down the ladder, identify the step or steps in their thought processes where their thinking diverged, and so hopefully realign their thinking and resolve their differences. And this tool sometimes can be very useful, yet it assumes some things about how our brains work. And it was developed before we knew much about how our brains work in worldview conflicts. What does this image, this data mean to you? Well, that's likely to depend upon who you are and how you see the world. Are you a hunter? Are you a member of a militia group? Are you a survivor of the Las Vegas shooting or the Sandy Hook school shooting? Are you an emergency room doctor? Let's imagine for a moment how a hypothetical gun control and gun rights advocate in the US each might experience and think about this image, this data, accepting the premise of the ladder of inference. 
A gun control advocate might reflexively see the gun as a killing machine. And reason that these killing machines, or many of them, are owned by extremists, some of whom are going to be unstable, in concluding that we have to ban them to protect our kids. A gun rights advocate might reflexively see the gun as a means of self-defense, reasoning that patriots use them to protect our liberties and that mental illness is the sole cause of mass killings. She might then conclude that we have to protect gun rights to protect our country against naive socialists. So in the context of a worldview conflict like this, would walking these partisans down the ladder, pointing out the different ways they perceive and reason about this data, help them find common ground? I'm not so sure. Neuroscientists like Tali Shiro are discovering that our brains work a bit differently than we understood when this tool is de was developed. When these partisans see the gun, their brains have a strong tendency to respond more like this. In worldview conflicts, we're probably dealing with at least two letters of inference that rest at least to some extent in separate pools of data. Some of the data each person is focused on is epistemically unavailable to the other party because it is produced by and only exists in one mind or the other. So the metaphor of a single shared pool of data breaks down. The situation is very much like my color vision example. We might think the parties easily should be able to see and understand how each of them is making meaning, but it's truly not so easy. All of us naturally try to resolve conflict in ways that fit our worldviews. Doing otherwise risks upsetting the normative order we exist in. Um, and in which our needs are satisfied. Most approaches to negotiation assume that what the parties are doing in the foreground, so to speak, is occurring against a, a shared normative background. In a worldview conflict, however, each party is operating from a different normative background at least partially. And that's what make these, makes these conflicts so challenging. And I believe that unless until it, our approaches to negotiating across worldviews take all parties' worldviews seriously, we have little hope of finding resolutions to these conflicts. We'll return to the gun control debate in just a minute. Uh, but now let's consider the conflict about carbon emissions as we talk about how worldviews can change. So as we've seen, worldviews are a bit like the air we breathe and that we move through, usually without even noticing it's there. Until that is something disrupts or challenges our experience. In the case of the air we breathe, something like smog or COVID-19. These and other sorts of disruptive experiences that can't be adequately fit into or explained by our worldviews may eventually compel us to alter them. These disruptive experiences can take many different types of forms. Um, interaction with others, conflictual interactions, um, 
who have a different worldview, for instance, intergroup conflict, um, interaction with others who share our worldviews, but not completely, uh, intragroup conflict. Also, personal experiences, our own reflection, developmental growth over the course of a lifetime. Um, but most of us, when faced with these worldview tensions, will quite naturally, for quite some time, try to fit the disruptive experiences, the uncomfortable experiences, the data that's in tension into our existing worldview or shut it out rather than questioning the adequacy of our worldview. And if and when we are ready to bring that perspective in, that data into our worldview, we're likely to expand it a bit just a bit or flex it a little bit rather than revising it wholesale. Some of you like me are probably old enough, I know Herb is, uh, to remember when gasoline had lead in it. Most people then couldn't foresee a climate crisis caused by burning carbon matter. Most of us were just concerned about uh, lead and other toxic substances emitted when fuel was burnt and how that could cause lung damage and other health problems. So we began to take the lead out of car exhaust after <laughs> fuel was burned in our engines with catalytic converters like the one pictured here. And that didn't accomplish enough. So we decided to make gasoline cleaner and then we tried to make other fuels cleaner. It took us decades for a critical mass of humanity uh, who had embraced a particular worldview to realize the problem was much bigger and more fundamental than this and to decide to do something about it, to alter our worldview and our ways of life accordingly. So how can we negotiate across worldviews to achieve positive change in any domain, from politics to the business world, to healthcare, to international relations, even our personal lives? Conflict involving our most deeply held values arises everywhere. Negotiating across worldviews successfully requires adjustments to the, the ways that we normally negotiate, adjustments that address uh, the differences between worldview conflict and other types of conflict. Some of what works in our ordinary disputes is useful when negotiating across worldviews, and some of it's not. And some of it actually can be counterproductive when negotiating across worldviews. In what follows, I'm going to focus on the key things we need to do differently in worldview negotiations, but I'm not suggesting that other things uh, we must do effectively in all intense negotiations, like uh, managing and harnessing emotion effectively are any less relevant here. So what's the challenge we're, we're facing in worldview negotiation and what goal should we be striving for and, and what would be a good approach to negotiate across worldviews? Well, in the conflict resolution field, we tend to divide methodologies into what I'll call dialogue on the one hand and negotiation on the other hand. And in dialogue, we relieve the parties of the pressure to reach agreement which tends to free them up to be more open and creative than they would be if they knew they would have to make uh, a commitment as they might at the end of a negotiation process. And we've had considerable success bringing parties together for dialogue in, in polarized conflicts, but we often struggle to transfer, translate good ideas produced through dialogue into action, into agreements and commitments. And the approach I'm, I wanna outline is designed to address this problem. And I believe the key is 
working much more intentionally and productively with and within the party's respective worldviews. The goal we're striving for, I want to suggest, is a mutually agreeable outcome that fits within multiple worldviews at once. So let's talk about the, pro the approach and what follows uh, it, it isn't about sort of sequential linear steps. Uh, what I want to talk about is just some of what, we're, what are likely to be key elements of any productive uh, worldview negotiation. Our starting point is simply accepting the conflict as it is. Almost like we accept the you are here mark uh, on a map at a shopping mall or a theme park. We need to invest relatively less energy in trying to get others to see the world the right way, the way we see it. And we need to start dealing with the reality that others really do experience and navigate life differently. So start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. A lovely quote that's uh, attributed variously to Arthur Ashe and Teddy Roosevelt. So individuals certainly have worldview conflicts, but most such conflicts between uh, two people are embedded in a larger conflict involving groups to which these people belong. So let's focus on these larger scale conflicts, which are especially challenging. Herb Kelman wrote a brilliant and influential article nearly 30 years ago called Coalitions Across Conflict Lines. And one key insight and prescription he offers there is about the need to build alliances between at least some people across the lines of conflict. Uh, we need to bring them to the negotiating table and then we need to uh, build bridges across the negotiating table, so to speak. But Herb cautions that we need to take care not to damage the credibility of these people and their influence with other members of their own group. The groups we belong to are not homogenous. They're internally diverse. So there's likely to be a, a negotiation within them, a negotiation behind the table on each side, along the way to any resolution that's achieved across the table. In worldview conflicts, in my experience, the experience of people I work with, suggests that these coalitions often need to extend even further across the table, deeper into each group. We need to identify what I like to call the dovish hawks. Peaceniks and other moderates, or many of them in each group, often will be willing to talk. And that remains important. But we need the contributions of people in subgroups toward the poles, subgroups that otherwise might become spoilers. And these dovish hawks exist. Uh, we may tend to caricature and, and margin, marginalize people who we consider to have more extreme views, but many are more three-dimensional, complex, and relatable than we imagine them to be. These dovish hawks ultimately will be what Christina Bicchieri, who studies how social norms change, calls trendsetters. The people who go out front, making it feel safe for other members of the group to embrace change. They'll play key roles in the work that has to be done behind the table. Another thing that often needs to happen in worldview conflicts as parties come together is that their dispositions need to shift to accomplish anything meaningful. Parties need to, to make a shift from what the Arbinger Institute in a lovely book called The Anatomy of Peace, uh, they need to shift from what they call a heart at war in which we objectify others in essence, 
treating them as obstacles, to a heart at peace, where we view others uh, as having hopes and needs and worldviews that are real, like our own. This is also the domain of Donna's incredible work uh, on dignity and her dignity model. And I recommend her books to you very highly as well. Um, in these conflicts, we too often regard others as less human than we are, even if our outward behaviors might appear otherwise. Another thing we need to do in worldview conflicts is to map the worldviews with particularity in all the ways they're implicated in the conflict and provide others with a guided tour of our worldview. Our worldviews, our worlds likely look flat to other people. Now, neuroscientists and sociologists and social psychologists and ethicists have come up with all sorts of ways to uh, study worldviews from brain imaging to something called moral foundations theory and surveys associated with it to lots of other tools and instruments. But in worldview negotiation, what we really need to do is to zoom in on specific features of the party's worldviews that influence the conflict. And we do this through dialogue and interviews and surveys and other means that are tailor-made to the situation. And when we do this, we often discover surprising things. And others' worlds become three-dimensional, spherical to us. Once we have these maps, we stack them, so to speak. So we can identify areas where terrain overlaps in places where there is no overlapping normative terrain, areas between which we will need to extend terrain or build bridges to reach agreement, even if the parties ultimately tell different stories about what that agreement means within their own worldview community. We don't really have time for more than a quick flyover of what it might look like to negotiate skillfully across the table and behind the table. But let me just say that uh, these negotiations across and behind the table need to be linked consciously and iteratively in ways that are adapted to the particular conflict and the twisted path that the negotiation takes over time. Across the table, a really key difference in worldview negotiations is that we need to focus much more on the symbolic dimensions of the conflict. We can't expect the other party to make concessions implicating its own sacred values by offering to concede things we and they see as having mundane value, money, for instance. And there's, there's good evidence that that will just uh, add fuel to the fire, it will backfire. So we have to be thoughtful, really thoughtful about sequencing and pat packaging exchanges involving things of both sacred and mundane value as we negotiate across the table. The negotiation behind the table can be equally challenging. And here, basically a group's members need to find safe ways to share information about their real beliefs and preferences. And it often feels very risky to do this. Um, they also need to find safe ways to have conversations about all this that can feel risky. And in these conversations, they need to identify everything that's at stake for them in the conflict. Um, items of value, returning to our, our gun rights, gun control example, um, guns, human lives, traditions, needs for safety, belonging, and so forth, and the full range of sacred values to be honored uh, in any resolution of the conflict, life, liberty, and so on. And the, the parties behind the table need to begin envisioning, brainstorming about new ways that they could serve multiple needs and values 
that could work potentially within all relevant worldviews. And they also may at some point need to devise safe ways to take some of what they think are their more promising ideas for low risk test drives. Uh, a dovish hawk in the group might float a new idea in an op-ed piece, for example. There's solid research and practice experience and wisdom about how to do all this that we can't get into uh, today, but it can be done. When gun rights advocates realized the vast majority of deaths caused by guns are suicides by gun owners, 90% of whom had owned their gun for a long time, not just gone out to purchase it. They became more concerned about the connection between mental illness and access to guns. And they started negotiating among themselves and with others about what to do. And this has begun to produce programs and state policies on the sale, permitting and storage of guns. Some of the types of things gun control advocates have been seeking for a long time. In order to sign on to change involving our sacred values, we have to believe that the bridge we're being asked to cross is secure on both sides. As my son discovered at a high ropes course years ago, we have to believe we're still serving our values by crossing the bridge of change, that we can continue to serve a value that we feared will be compromised while also serving other values we hold dear. We have to believe we can serve our core values, multiple values, even more productively on the new ground to which we're being asked to cross. So in conclusion, let me just say, uh, most of us have a worldview that anchors our sense of self and helps us navigate the world and fulfill our needs. And we naturally all try to resolve conflict, everyday conflict and worldview conflicts um, in ways that fit our own worldview. And since we're all doing this all the time, we're all in this together, odds are that we need to take others' worldviews seriously in order to negotiate across worldview differences successfully. This is really challenging and it's possible. So thanks for your time and attention and uh, I look forward to your thoughts. Okay, um, Jeff, let me just see if I can get back on the screen again. Um, there I am. Lovely job, Jeff. And it's just such a terrific integration of so many different uh, literatures and really happy that you, uh, that you highlighted Herb's uh, negotiating uh, the creating coalitions uh, article. I think that's just such a profound piece as well, but you did a beautiful job and with and so thoughtfully connected uh, many, many issues that all of us have been grappling with. So this does put everything in a really nice package. And I thank you for that. We have a sit, several questions. Um, the first one uh, is that this person, Pamela, said that she was recently in a webinar and the speaker predicated that belonging is actually a more basic human need than food and water that Maslow indicates. What do you think? You know, uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and it could explain why people will make, uh, you know, make the ultimate sa sacrifice uh, for their groups, uh, you know, really not just, you know, put their physical needs uh, above the group or, or, or below the group, but, um, but extinguish their physical existence for the group. Um, Maslow, as I understand it, actually never uh, arranged the needs in a fixed hierarchy as we often see them depicted. Um, he always thought they were dynamic and shifting and interrelated. Um, 
And, uh, and it was only people who came later who sort of arranged them in a hierarchy, I believe. Um, so uh, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised, uh, you know, if empirically that could be established, yeah. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, someone else is asking um, about just thanking you for the content. This is JH. Uh, could you, Jeff, share a real-world story that brings these skills to life? I could, uh, I could uh, certainly share many from the international context, which is where I do a lot of my own work. I've been working, as, as Don and others know, for a number of years in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian con conflict, uh, and specifically around some of the tougher issues in the conflict, like uh, the Temple Mount, Al-Aqsa Mosque complex in Jerusalem and so forth. And I could give you examples from that context. This is about the US, however. One, one example that's not from my personal experience that uh, I find very interesting. And uh, it, it, it is, it's going to provoke strong reactions from all of them, all of us, or many of us. I myself have strong reactions to it. But um, uh, in the Seattle area, there was a, a, doctors faced a real moral dilemma when uh, Somali immigrant families insisted that, uh, uh, that the doctors perform female circumcision, as they would call it, um, on their young daughters after they were delivered. And the doctors refused to do it. And, uh, and the family started just going back to Somalia um, for this practice. And they basically had a worldview negotiation around this eventually, and, uh, and came up with a, <laughs> You know, uh, still I find this challenging. A, a but a a you know a very minimally invasive, very symbolic version of this um, that the doctors concluded uh, caused less harm than was going to occur if they refused to do it. Tough negotiation, lots of differences. Um, I'm not going to judge it or not judge it. But there's a real world US example of, of a negotiation across worldviews that had an outcome that changed practices and one could argue uh, reduced harm, uh, you know, from the perspective of, of at least one of these worldviews. Okay, Jeff, thanks. Here's one from our friend and colleague, Susan Putziva. She's asking, how do you work with uh, aspects of worldviews that do not overlap or only show gaps, but actually are in direct opposition to one another. For example, when theological assumptions of members of one religion are in direct contradiction to members of another. Yeah. Hi, Susan. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, as you well know, <laughs> this is really, really hard. Uh, I don't want to be a, on record as saying uh, we have a magic wand here and that this is always possible. Um, but I think your question highlights the extent to which in these types of worldview negotiations, the work behind the table, you know, what we call the intra-party work or negotiation is always important or, you know, often more important. So as we identify these gaps or even these diametrically opposed areas, um, you know, the work really turns uh, to, to sort of the within group work and, you know, theologians would call it hermeneutical work um, within this discourse community around, uh, around these norms and values. And often in my experience in the context in which I've worked. Uh, once the, the parties inside a group begin to see the range, the diversity of thinking within the group, and there always is a great degree of interpretive flexibility around such things within a group, even though to outsiders, it might look like there's not. Um, there can be ways to creatively reframe 
you know, how values are applied, to reprioritize values, to write new narratives around what the future uh, requires of us um, theologically and so forth. Um, so it's, it's a real creative process and it may take time. And it may be that across the table uh, that, that remains for some time a real constraint on what's possible. It might be possible to reach other sorts of agreements and get other things done across the table, but it may take some time for, uh, um, for those features of a negotiation to produce something across the table. One last uh, point on this. I think time is a really interesting dimension on this point that we often um, overlook. There can be ways to, uh, to work with time in the context of a negotiation. We saw this in the Iran nuclear treaty, for instance, with the 10 or 15 year horizon, you know, allowing Iran to not give up uh, its, its insistence on its right to have nuclear weapons, but to kick that can down the road for some time. Um, so oftentimes we can reach agreements that, that work with time in creative ways as well. All right, thanks, Jeff. Um, here's another um, interesting question from mediation experience. All parties need to at least hear out the worldview of the other party. Nowadays in social discourse, uh, for example, with QAnon, there seems not to be this common ground anymore. How do you personally handle situations where the other's worldview is not accepted? I, it's, it's interesting to have QAnon in that question. I've been asking myself recently, is, Q, is QAnon a worldview? Um, I, I haven't fully thought that one out. Um, this is, to me, the question gets to the importance of this dispositional shift I'm talking about. And it can be really, really hard to, um, to sort of, I, I don't wanna say accept another par party's worldview. I'm not suggesting we always can do that or need to do that, but to grant that the other party has a worldview, that there may be some basis for their beliefs, um, even if we don't share them. Um, boy, you know, uh, read Donna's book. Uh, uh, we could have a long conversation about this. Um, this might be a good moment or a good point to share something I heard really, uh, really interesting. I heard recently about this disposition point. I heard Ezra Klein uh, interview the novelist George Saunders, who, whose meta theme in his work is about kindness and mm -hmm. how challenging it is and important it is to be kind in a, in a world that uh, it can be very hard to be kind in. And Saunders said something really interesting uh, in this. He said, he said uh, I'm actually pretty clear about my own moral vision and where my limits are and stuff. And that's actually helpful to me in encountering people with other worldviews. I find that that clarity allows me, I feel safe with it. So it allows me to open up more, to be more expansive, to be more curious about another person's worldview, um, in essence. And I think that uh, it, it, he captured something about the, the disposition we need when we're, we're endeavoring to do exactly what this question get to that. Okay, Jeff. Well, we probably have time for just a few more. Um, here's another one. This is um, by Yuri. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm afraid to mispronounce people's names. So if I don't say this is identify you is only because I'm, a, I'm worried that I'm going <laughs> to mess up the pronunciation. So Yuri is asking, it seems that the model of negotiation you presented assumes relatively equal levels of power. What about asymmetrical situations, such as negotiations between indigenous communities and Hispanic ruling elites in Latin America? How can indigenous communities convince Hispanic powerful elites to negotiate issues regarding respect for the political and economic rights of indigenous people? Thank you, he says. 
you know, that is such a big question. And I'm, I, I feel some trepidation about even, you know, venturing a, a partial and insufficient answer briefly here. Um, let me just approach it this way. I mean, I, the, the, the problem, the reality of power asymmetries and power imbalances like you're talking about is real. And, uh, and, uh, and often structural, as I think it is in the case you're describing. And we need to take that seriously. Um, uh, what I'm suggesting, I wanna say, is, you know, you're talking about a marginalized worldview in this example. And I'm talking about an approach to negotiation, and I don't think we really have time to get into it here, but it, that is designed in the context of the negotiation to elevate that worldview, to not marginalize it. Um, and I see this as an empowering move. Um, and, and from that uh, plane or in that space that we hope to create in this negotiation context, um, I'm not suggesting that all the power asymmetries and material and social imbalances and stuff go away, but, um, but I think it's a fundamentally empowering move to begin to address those other disparities and the structural issues if we can, if we can at, at least get uh, the party's worldviews on an even plane where they, where they have equal dignity, so to speak. Okay, Jeff, um, here's another one from our co colleague, um, Polly Hamlin, former PON um, worker. So to build on Susan Patsiba's question, how would you recommend approaching worldviews in which identity is at stake? If a worldview leads a person to see another person as sinful, for example, or denies their right to live, what are they? Oh, no, oh, sorry, that denies their right to live as they are. Yeah. Hi, Polly, and thank you for that question. Um, boy, these are tough questions, right? I mean, you know, they really get at the, the heart of what's challenging about these, these conflicts. Um, I'm glad actually you, you brought identity into this question. I think uh, identity has been core to Herb's work and the training that Don, Donna and I had under Herb. Um, uh, I, wanna, I wanna point out that I view the, the concept or the construct in conflict resolution as, of identity as in a way more fundamental than worldviews. It, 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 it can incorporate many things that we don't, that aren't necessarily part of worldviews, parts of our heritage and language and stuff that may or may not be actually part of the worldview we hold. But it, what I'm suggesting is that it, in many conflicts I've dealt with, there hasn't been a, we need to kind of step up a level from identity and focus on the normative constraints and permissions. Uh, that it, it exists. Um, the worldview as a feature of identity needs to be brought into higher relief. Um, I keep returning to that dispositional shift, and I'll, you know, and I'll point to Don's work on dignity again. I mean, that is a kind of dignity question, I think. And and I I I I come back to the the reality that much of the work we need to do in the conflicts, the context of of uh, worldview negotiation, is to try to help people make that shift. And uh, we we know some things about how to support people in making that shift. So that's a, a little bit of a general or vague answer, but um, but I'd point back to the dispositional work that needs to be done. You know, Jeff, these questions were remarkable. And I think they, they really got to the heart of the matter of the topic that you're grappling with here with negotiating across worldviews. And I think because they were so expressed so well and that there's so many of them that are reaching deep into you know, that, that's that possibility of negotiating across, people wanna know about this. So I am so happy that you're doing this work. It's absolutely crucial now and probably you know, forever that you're really making explicit 
something so fundamental to the human experience here. And thank you for all of your hard work and all the research that you've done to try to shed light on this very, very challenging topic. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank everybody for coming. There's wonderful comments in the chat. Um, function. And I just hope you come back for our next Herbert C. Kelman seminar. So thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.